Right, well, good day to all of you, uh, wherever in the world you might be listening in from. Uh, welcome to the March webinar on intangible assets, specifically, well, IS38, uh, the accounting for intangible assets. Um, today we're going to be looking at the accounting treatment uh, required by IS38. And uh, the IS38, well, intangible assets by their nature introduce some unique challenges uh, that entities do not uh, experience with tangible assets, with accounting for tangible assets. Although there are similarities between the accounting treatments for tangible and intangible assets, part of the challenge is actually understanding or, or actually identifying whether an intangible asset um, meets the definition of an intangible asset. So to start off with, we look at what the definition of an intangible asset is. And IS38 tells us that it's an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. So the key characteristics uh, embodied in the definition of intangible assets are that firstly it must meet the definition of an asset and secondly that it must be identifiable. Um, identifiability is, is essentially talking about whether or not the asset is either separable or whether it arises from contractual or other legal rights. Now given the nature of an intangible asset, something that cannot physically be touched or seen, uh, in order for an asset to be identifiable, we, we must be able to at least know what we're talking about. And, and that's essentially what this, what this aspect of the definition is talking about. Um, if something arises from contractual or legal rights, those contractual or legal rights immediately tell us what it is that we're dealing with. But when we're talking about something that comes from something else, something that is not necessarily a contractual or legal arrangement, we then need to apply our judgment to consider whether it can actually be separated from the rest of a business. So for example, if we're talking about a, an, a company's brand, uh, the brand itself is generally not separable from the rest of the company because one can't really sell a brand without selling all of the rest of the business that goes with that brand. Uh, so a lot of judgment comes in in determining whether an intangible asset, something that appears to be an intangible asset at face value, is in fact an intangible asset on the basis of uh, the criteria for identifiability. The second aspect of the definition talks about uh, it, it must be an asset. And in terms of the, the conceptual framework uh, for IFRS, an asset is a resource controlled by an entity as a result of a past event from which the entity expects future economic benefits uh, to flow to it. So anything that will result in future benefit could potentially meet the definition of an asset provided the entity is able to demonstrate the fact that it can actually control it and that it arises from past events. Now we'll look at different types of intangible assets in just a moment, but if we do have an asset that meets the definition of an intangible asset, at initial recognition, we measure it at cost, generally speaking. However, there are different ways in which intangible assets can actually be obtained, and depending on how those assets are obtained, there are different ways uh, to account for those at initial recognition. So, out of the five possibilities we've got, we see in front of us there, uh, the first way is through separate acquisition, uh, and that would be at cost, but we could also uh, obtain an intangible asset through government grant, through an exchange of assets, uh, it can be internally generated in certain instances, or we could actually acquire an intangible asset through business combination. And I'd like to spend a bit of time just looking at the various w uh, means of obtaining intangible assets, because that will essentially uh, explain to us then how we need to recognize these things initially. So to start off with the first one, uh, through separate acquisition, that would generally involve one entity going out and acquiring an intangible asset from another entity. The intangible asset could be a single asset that is the subject of the transaction. So two parties come together and they decide that they will actually, uh, well, one, one party will acquire the intangible asset from another party. And if that's the case, well, then it's, it's, no, it's no different to going out and buying an item of property, plant, and equipment. Basically, cost includes whatever you've paid for the asset together with any duties, non-refundable taxes, and any other directly attributable costs necessary to get the asset to its location and condition so that it can be used as management intends. So what that means is if, if an entity goes out and acquires a, a license from another entity, 
it could be a software license, it could be a, a patent agreement, a, a right to use a particular process or something along those lines. Regardless of what type of intangible asset it is, anything that it costs the entity to acquire that asset will form part of that cost. And if the payment terms are deferred, uh, so if, if, if the entity uh, at the same time as acquiring the asset also incurs a liability to, to pay for that at some point in the future, then the, discount, the, the, then the purchase price is discounted to present value using an appropriate market rate. So in principle, that, that, that is no different than to acquiring a, a tangible asset. The next way of acquiring a tangible asset uh, could be through government grant. Uh, depending on, on various governments around the world, some governments might actively uh, try to stimulate development in a particular area or to try and encourage entities to, to undertake certain economic activity could actually give intangible assets uh, to entities free of charge or for a nominal amount. If an entity acquires an intangible asset through government grant, IAS 20, the standard on accounting for government grants, basically says that there's two possible uh, accounting treatments under those circumstances. An entity could either recognize that asset that's been re received at fair value, that would be the one possibility, and then the amount of revenue that is recognized um, as the counter entry to, to, to recognizing the, the asset would be at the fair value of the asset received. However, IS20 also says that an entity could choose an accounting policy to instead recognize the asset received in a government grant at nominal amount, plus any directly attributable costs, if any, and then the corresponding entry uh, on the revenue side would be at that nominal amount. Now, that basically means that depending on your accounting policy choice, you will be able to decide then which of the two um, you believe is more, more relevant and more reliable uh, for the purposes of, of accounting for that, that asset. So examples of these types of things would be uh, broadcast licenses, uh, fishing licenses, any kind of license where government has given a right to another entity uh, to perform some kind of, of activity or that results in some kind of benefit for, for the, ent the recipient entity. The third possibility would be uh, to exchange assets. The third possibility could be that an entity would internally generate the in, in, intangible asset. Now, first off, I must I highlight the fact that IS38 prohibits recognizing internally generated goodwill. Internally generated goodwill essentially reflects an entity's reputation. Um, it, 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 it usually is something that's indistinguishable from the business as a whole. And going back to what I said about the definition of an intangible asset up front, an, a, an asset is, in, is identifiable if it is capable of being separated from the business. So on the basis that it's impossible to separate one's reputation from the rest of the business, internally generated goodwill is usually uh, prohibited from being recognized. And similar types of, of, of assets, um, well, benefits, uh, things such as brand names, customer lists, publishing titles, and any other similar asset to these types of, of benefits would also be prohibited from being recognized as intangible assets. However, IS38 does permit some internally generated assets to be recognized, um, specifically internally generated development costs or development assets. Um, now the general principle here as well is that research expenditure is expensed as and when it's incurred, whereas development expenditure that meets certain criteria is able to be capitalized then as an internally generated intangible asset. So many entities that undertake certain of these, these projects, uh, for example, pharmaceutical companies, uh, software developers, those types of things, all of those are essentially internally generated projects. And depending on the circumstances, parts of those costs would be expensed to the extent that they relate to the research activities in the project, whereas costs that meet the development, in, once the entity reaches the development phase of a project, it would be able to capitalize costs relating to development.
It's not so much the nature of the expense, but rather when the expense is incurred that determines whether or not an entity is in the research phase or the development phase. So what the standard says is that an entity is able to capitalize costs when all of the following criteria have been met. And, and it, it really is a point in time when all of these boxes have been ticked. When an entity is able to demonstrate the technical feasibility of a particular project, as well as, as its intention to complete the intangible asset and use or sell it, as well as its ability to use or sell the intangible asset, as well as its it, well, it, it is also able to demonstrate how the intangible asset will generate probable future economic benefits. For example, there's a market for the output of the asset or for the asset itself. Or if it's something that it plans to use internally, how it would be able to use it and therefore demonstrating the, the future economic benefits. As well as demonstrating the availability of adequate resources. And finally, its ability to measure reliably any expenditure attributable to the asset during development. Once all of those boxes have been ticked, an entity is then able to demonstrate that it is now in the development phase of a project, an internal project, and thereafter all directly attributable costs relating to that, uh, to that development project would then form part of the cost of a, uh, an internally generated intangible asset. So if one looks at some of the big software companies, um, at a point in time, you'll have certain costs such as programmer salaries and those types of things um, uh, being expensed because they they meet the def well they don't meet the definition of development expenditure. So for as long as they are research in nature, while they are still exploring feasibility of the project, uh, trying different courses of action, different functionality within the software and those types of things, those costs would then be research costs that would be expensed. But the moment all of these criteria then for the development phase have been met, the programmer salary will suddenly form part of the development phase and then would be capitalized to the cost of that intangible asset. The standard says that the following costs can be capitalized once you meet the criteria for de the, the development phase of the project. Uh, any expenditure on any materials and services to generate this, the asset. Any salaries and wages of personnel engaged directly in generating the asset. Borrowing costs under IS-23 if it meets the definition of a qualifying asset and any other directly attributable expenditure. The, set, the standard then elaborates even further and says that the following costs would normally be excluded uh, and that would include any selling, administrative and any other general overheads unless they are directly attributable, any inefficiencies and initial operating losses, as well as any staff training to operate the asset once it is complete. And it's important to understand that once an asset is ready, once it's reached the point where it, could, it, it, is, it is available for use, the fact that staff might not necessarily know how to use it yet does not affect the, the condition of the asset itself. So once the, going back to the example of a software product, uh, project, once the software is completed, once all of the coding and functionality and all of that has been finalized, then any, any staff training, for example, if it's, if it's a project that's going to be used internally, any staff training to, to teach the staff how to use the new software is essentially a cost to operate the asset and must be expensed. It cannot be capitalized to the cost of developing the asset as, as, as a whole. And that principle is exactly the same as, as under property plants and equipment for tangible assets as well. The final possibility to, or the, the, the other, the last possible, possible way of acquiring an intangible asset would be through a business combination. Now, we have gone through, there, there has been a previous webinar on business combinations, and if any of you would like to, to refer to that, I encourage you to just look at the, at the, um, appropriate webinar under your, under your widgets. But, the principle under a business combination is that a business combination involves a, 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 an integrated set of activities which can c include all sorts of assets and liabilities that are capable of generating benefits for various stakeholders. So when one entity acquires the business of another entity, either by acquiring another entity in totality or by acquiring a whole bunch of assets or liabilities that together are capable of generating outflows, uh, outputs for, for the acquirer, um, 
an entity needs to identify all of the assets and liabilities that it is receiving. So the acquirer in a business combination needs to look to all of the assets and liabilities that it is receiving and any difference between the fair value of those assets and liabilities acquired and the total consideration paid is recognized as goodwill. Now historically under, under well, when, when business combination accounting was first developed, historically goodwill was basically the balancing figure for any, any unknown benefits that, that, that the entity was not able to identify. But as IFRS 3 in its current form at IFRS 3, the, 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 the 2008 version of IFRS 3 uh, spe specifies, an, ent an acquiring entity in a business combination needs to look for all possible identified and previously unidentified intangible assets and measure all of those at fair value as well. So it does not just look in the, in the graphic in front of you, it's not just the, the green block which maybe comprises all of the assets and liabilities which might have actually been recognized by the acquiry previously, but in addition to that it needs to look for anything that might not have previously been recognized by the acquiree, but from the perspective of the acquirer would meet the definition of an intangible asset. What that means is, in a business combination, an entity could end up recognizing things which were never recognized in the past. And that means that any balance in figure should presumably be much smaller because the IFRS 3 would require an, an acquirer to go and, and actually look for all possible intangible assets, all possible benefits which would have resulted in the entity paying more for the asset uh, more for the business than what the actual recognized assets and liabilities might have might have comprised. In order for an intangible asset to be recognized, I mean, re irrespective of whether it's in a business combination or not, it must still meet the definition of an asset and it must still meet the definition of an intangible asset. It must still meet, uh, meet the recognition criteria as well. In other words, it must still be probable that future economic benefits will flow to the entity and the fair values must be measured reliably. So business combination accounting doesn't change any of that. However, IS38 does say that in a business combination it is presumed that an entity is assuming that it will be probable that future economic benefits will, will flow to an entity. Otherwise, why else would it have actually entered into the business combination to begin with? So that aspect of the recognition criteria is generally always met when it comes to a business combination and that means that all that the acquirer needs to demonstrate is the identifiability of the asset or the benefit and it must be able to measure it. Obviously if it's unable to measure it, well then it's not able to recognize it at fair value in a business combination. So that means that in a business combination, certain things that were never recognized or perhaps because they were not identifiable from the perspective of the uh, acquiree, perhaps they were not separable, could potentially be recognized by the acquirer. Look at a couple of examples over here. In the scenario, it's not a Okay, let's look at them. In the first one, skills and experience of winemaker. Now, although the I mean, the fact that the acquirer had not gone out and, and had access to the skills and experience of the winemaker, generally speaking, there's no way to risk to control the skills and experience of the winemaker. Probably the winemaker could leave the employer of, of the business at any point in time. And so on that basis, it would not ordinarily meet the deficient asset given that the entity is able to control the access to benefits. So we would argue that that would not meet the deficient recognized as an acquisition because it would not be deficient of an asset. A brand name attached to wines from the vineyard. Now, over time, uh, the vineyard is operating to a exchange with the brand. But it is a brand name of the entity. The entity is officially a job-sharing brand. It's from the digital data. I have a product of acquirer. That brand name is separate from the product of the headway company. So it's not a substance. It would not be the primary sentence. Doing finishing of the last and it's having a on value of the product of the function. Intangible assets, things such as trade marks, trade names, internet dom domain names, trade dresses, newspaper mastheads, non-competition agreements, we also have artistic related intangible assets, uh, plays, music, books, pictures, videos, 
contract-based intangibles, licensing and royalty agreements, lease agreements, franchise agreements, operating and broadcast rights and all sorts of other types of mineral rights and, and air rights, customer related intangibles, things such as our customer lists, order backlogs, customer contracts and relationships, and even non-contractual customer relationships. That goes back then to, to talking about reputation and those types of things. Uh, the, the fact that an entity has developed some kind of rapport with its customers could be, could be an, an intangible asset as part of a business combination. Certainly not from the perspective of the entity that's developed that, that contractual relation or that non-contractual relationship, but if an entity acquires these types of relationships as part of a business combination, that could certainly have some benefit. And then we've also got our technology-based intangibles, patents, computer software, unpatented technology as well, uh, date, databases and trade secrets. All of these are examples of things that could conceivably meet the definition of intangible assets. The list is certainly not exhaustive, but what's important to understand is that it would always depend on the respective entities and, and differ on a case-by-case -case basis. What an entity needs to do is apply the definition and recognition criteria of intangible assets to these various examples that we've spoken to and ask the question, does it meet the definition of an intangible asset from our perspective? If not, it cannot be recognized. If it does, well then yes, certainly it can, be rec it can and must then be recognized as an intangible asset and accounted for in terms of IS-38. Regardless of how the intangible asset is recognized initially or, or acquired initially, um, for example, even for these things that come about through, through exchanges or through government grants or through business combinations, despite the fact that those methods of acquisition require initial measurement at fair value, that fair value then becomes cost for the purposes of accounting for this subsequently. So for subsequent measurement, uh, we would then have to make a choice between two possibilities. We can either be on the cost model or the revaluation model for accounting for these things. Um, the revaluation model is generally unlikely to be applied. It's, it's available as an accounting policy choice similar to, to the revaluation model for property, plants and equipment. However, in the case of intangible assets, the revaluation model is only permitted if there is an active market. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. Irrespective of whether there's an uh, 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 whether we're on the cost model or the revaluation model, IS-38 says there's two possible types of intangible assets. We either have a finite life intangible asset or an indefinite life intangible asset. If there is, uh, well, if we've got a finite life intangible asset, the accounting is pretty straightforward. Um, very similar to, to property, plants and equipment, we essentially need to amortize the cost or amount substituted for cost depending on how the asset was acquired, but we amortize the amount recognized that initial recognition over the useful life of the asset. And the process of amortization is pretty much the same as, as depreciation for tangible assets as well. Uh, as with depreciation, it's, such, it's not so much a, a means to reflect the value of the asset, but rather it's an allocation of the cost of the asset over the, 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 the life of the asset to, to essentially take a portion of the cost over each period in which the asset has actually been used. So amortization, as with depreciation, we start amortizing when the asset is ready for use, not necessarily only when it's brought into use, but the moment the asset is in the location and condition uh, so, so that it can be used as intended by management. The useful life should reflect, or sorry, the amortization method should reflect the expected pattern of utility that we expect from the asset. So as with property, plants and equipment, there are different types of amortization methods. Um, the one that springs to, mo to most people's minds is usually the, the straight line method, which essentially says, uh, recognizes the fact that an intangible asset's utility is identical in every year over the, the, the life of that asset and that then allocates an equal amount of, of, of cost in each period in which the asset is expected to be used. But that, although that might be the easiest one, uh, the, the easiest amortization method, it's not necessarily going to be the, the most appropriate. Uh, the, the choice or the method that's used should actually ref reflect information that is most relevant and, and best reflects the pattern of consumption of the benefit. What that means is that if the benefit uh, is perhaps linked to 
say, a, a number of units of output. Let's say uh, the, the, the intangible asset that the entity has acquired is a right to use a patent to produce a certain number of items of, of, of inventory. Um, on that basis, the method that should be used in the, the most appropriate method would be a production units method. And then as a result of that, because the production unit method reflects uh, utility over the number of units of output, the useful life of that asset would then reflect the, num the total number of items that the entity is, is entitled to produce in terms of the agreement. And then it would allocate amortization based on the number of items produced in, in every single reporting period. So there are various techniques that can be used. The entity is required to use the technique that best reflects its utility, its use of the particular asset, and the useful life then reflects that utility. So it's not necessarily going to be an industry norm. It's not necessarily going to be uh, based on tax write-offs or anything like that. It's going to be what is best reflecting the, the, the total benefit that the entity expects out of this particular intangible asset. With intangible assets or, well, with, with property plants and equipment, entities are required to determine the residual value of the asset and deduct that from the cost to arrive at the depreciable amount. That same principle applies with intangible assets. However, in the case of intangibles, residual values are assumed to be zero unless there's an active market for the residual, for, for the intangible asset or where there's some kind of commitment from a third party to purchase the intangible asset at the end of the useful life of the intangible asset from the perspective of the, of the entity that holds it at the moment. Now that would only really apply in a circumstance where an intangible asset has an economic life in excess of the useful life. And it would depend on the facts and circumstances. Generally speaking, most intangible assets would probably have a null residual value, and therefore it's unnecessary to, to take that into account. But an entity is still required to make an assessment of whether or not that, that assumption is in fact appropriate. An entity is still also required to reassess uh, whether or not there's been a change in a, the residual value amortization period or amortization method. If there has been a change in the residual value amortization period or amortization method, that change is treated as a change in estimate and accounted for prospectively in accordance with IS-8. So if there is a change, the entity is not required to go back and restate any of the, the previous figures reported or any of its comparative information provided that the previous estimates were correct. In other words, were based on uh, the best available information at that point in time where the estimate was made. If, however, the estimates were incorrect or perhaps the, the estimates were never revi revised as required by, by IS-38, then an entity would have to go back and correct that as a correction of an error. With indefinite life financial assets, and it's important to understand here that we're talking about indefinite as opposed to infinite. Now, an indefinite life intangible asset reflects the situation where an entity is unsure as to what the actual useful life is. It, 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 there's no apparent limit, and as a result, it cannot put, pin down a specific estimate of what the useful life is when it, when it is trying to estimate the useful life. Presumably, there is some end, otherwise it would be infinite, but it's, it's reflecting the uncertainty as to what that, that end might be or what the total utility might be. And what IS-38 says is in the case of an indefinite intangible asset, an indefinite life intangible asset, an entity is not required to amortize it, but it is required to leave it at costless impairment and is, in, in addition to that, is required to test for impairment annually. Irrespective of whether there's an indication of impairment or not, it, is, it has to go and determine the recoverable amount for that asset on an annual basis. And if an impairment loss has been suffered, it would then have to account for that impairment loss uh, and, and, and reduce the value of the asset. So unlike other intangible assets or other tangible assets for that matter, where we only test for impairment where there's an indicator of impairment under IS-36, we would only test for, well, in, in the case of an indefinite life intangible asset, we have to test irrespective of whether there's an, an indicator of impairment. We also need to re reassess the use for life, and if at some point in, in time an, a, a formerly indefinite life intangible asset uh, 
becomes a finite life intangible asset. In other words, if at a point in time a useful life is then determinable, at that point in time that will result in one final impairment test because that in itself would, would essentially be an impairment of indica uh, uh, an, in, an indicator of impairment uh, where a former indefinite life intangible asset has now got a limited life and at that point in time the entity would have to begin amortizing over the, 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 the newly determined use for life. So for as long as an asset is, has an indefinite life, no amortization, but test for impairment annually. If an asset does have a, a finite life, we, we amortize that over the use for life. And as I said to you earlier, uh, we do not, um, well, it's unlikely that we would use the, the revaluation model. If an entity does qualify for the revaluation model on the basis that there is an active market for the intangible asset, that it is something that can be traded, and as a result then uh, there, there is a fair value for the asset, uh, the standard says that any increases in fair value are accounted for in a revaluation reserve through other comprehensive income. So the revaluation of an intangible asset should not affect profit or loss. And once an intangible asset is eventually sold, any amounts recognized in, in other comprehensive income are not reclassified to profit or loss, but are instead transferred to, other, uh, to, to, to retained earnings uh, directly in equity. They, they, in other words, the revaluation of an, of an intangible asset should never affect profit or loss. That intangible assets, in a nutshell, and uh, I'll take any questions if there are any. I see there have been some questions asked during the, the, the presentation. Um, are any of you, are there any other questions you might have? Folks, if there are any other questions, please feel free to submit them and we can respond to them uh, via email. Our email is hotline at wconsulting.co.za. Uh, but at the moment, I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for your attendance. And I look forward to speaking to you in one of the future updates soon. Thanks and take care.